Good morning, Bookie Monsters. Welcome. Welcome to Bookie Monsters. Welcome or welcome back. It is early in the morning. Uh, if you're watching it live, if you're watching it on replay, I appreciate that too. Thank you very much. My name is PK, and on the morning show, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Monday, and yesterday we looked at romances, there wasn't any sci-fi fantasy, and looked at some cozy mysteries, but uh, now we're going to look at fiction, and some more cozies, because there's always a lot of cozies. I hope you are having a good Wednesday morning, it is August the 16th. Already halfway through the month of August, which is crazy. We're already at August, which is also crazy. So let's get rid of the banner. And we're going to go to this website, which is bookriot.com. Keo. Keo. No. Keo likes to uh, lick his paw, and we, we're trying to stop that at the moment. All right, let's look at straight fiction, general fiction, adult fiction. Cover wise, interesting. First one here is An American Immigrant by Joanna Rojas Van. A Colombian American journalist tries to save her career by taking an assignment somewhere she never thought she'd go, Colombia in this heartwarming debut novel about rediscovering our family stories. Melanie Carvajal is a 25-year-old Colombian-American, but if anyone were to ask where she's from, she'd answer Maryland, as she should. Her parents are immigrants, but it's not something she's ever felt the need to talk about. She had enough of that growing up, always feeling like an outsider. Up until now, she's done everything possible to overachieve, and it's worked. She's insisted, she insists her girl, her grit, and dedication to the study of journalism are what landed her a job at the Miami Herald right out of college. But her first year as a reporter isn't going as planned. Article after article returns to her marked up in red pen or not published at all. Well, that's called learning because you're in an entry level job. Desperate to save her career with a piece that will remind her boss why he hired her in the first place, she takes an assignment that sends her to Cali, Colombia. But what, she start, but what starts as a professional opportunity soon becomes a journey of self-discovery. Between finding her mother's journals that contain stories she's never heard, reconnecting with her loving abuela whom she has not seen in years, and discovering a love for the heritage she's long pushed away, Melanie will learn what, what makes her the writer and the person she was created to be. That's called becoming an adult. You go through these things. It's not instant. But this is joining her journey. In the Lobby of the Dream Hotel by Genevieve Plunkett. A young mother finds herself caught between a love affair and the wrath of her husband, who will do anything to put an end to it, even use his wife's bipolar diagnosis against her. When faced with newfound feelings for Theo, the drummer of her band, married young mother Portia must decide whether to follow her heart or question her sanity. Going off her medication feels like waking up for the first time, but could this clarity be harmless daydreaming or a symptom of something much worse? Portia's husband, a well-respected prosecutor in their small Vermont town, is convinced of the latter. He retaliates, initiating an intervention, claiming that Portia's behavior is proof of her bipolar disorder. With lawyer-like lawyer -like cunning, he uses elements from her past to break her resolve until she agrees to be to being committed to a psychiatric hospital. In the hospital, Portia's sense of reality is tested, and hard truths about her marriage, her love for Theo, and her most vulnerable hopes and desires are revealed. In the lobby of the Dream Hotel is a potent and at times devastating story of stark tenderness. Written like a dream, this novel brings us toward new understandings of the flawed, yearning, multifaceted self. Skip to the End by Molly James. Three kisses, two breakups, one happy ending. Amy Daniels has a pretty nice life. Her career is on the up, she loves her friends, and she's about to buy her very own flat. 
on a good day, Amy could be described as a catch. So why is she perpetually single? The trouble is Amy can see something no one else can. The end. As soon as she kisses someone, she knows in intimate, vivid detail how their relationship will finish. A screaming argument in the middle of the supermarket over milk, an explicit email sent to the wrong address, a hasty escape through a bathroom window on the second date, at the altar, runaway bride style. There seems to be no end to the unhappy endings. After years of trying and failing to change a pre-written future, Amy has given up. But then she drunkenly kisses three men at her best friend's wedding and sees three possible endings. Two painful, one perfect. The problem is Amy can't really remember who she kissed and worse, what ending belongs to which person. The only thing she knows for certain is that she's determined to find out. I have thoughts. The Invisible Hour by Alice Hoffman. One brilliant June day when Mia Jacob can no longer see a way to survive, the power of words saves her. The Scarlet Letter was written almost 200 years earlier but it seems to tell the story of Mia's mother, Ivy, and their life inside the community, an oppressive cult in Western Massachusetts, where contact with the outside world is forbidden and books are considered evil. But how could this be? How could Nathaniel Hawthorne have so perfectly captured the pain and loss Mia carries inside her? Through a journey of heartbreak, love, and time, Mia must abandon the rules she was raised with at the community. As she does, she realizes that reading can transport you to other worlds or bring them to you, and that readers and writers affect one another in mysterious ways. She learns that time is more fluid than she can imagine, and that love is stronger than any chains that binds you. As a girl, Mia fell in love with a book. Now as a young woman, she falls in love with a brilliant writer as she makes her way back in time. But what if Nathaniel Hawthorne never wrote the Scarlet Letter? And what if Mia Jacob never found out on the day she planned to die? Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote, a single dream is more powerful than a thousand realities. This is the story of one woman's dream. For a little while, it came true. Good morning, Alicia. You're going to try and join us. I appreciate that. You are up early. You have the Invisible Hour to Read for Book Club. Oh, yes. Well, it certainly sounds interesting. You know, for me, I don't read general fiction, but it ticks the boxes of being about reading and, and uh, interesting that it's about Nathaniel Hawthorne. The Romantic. I have a sneeze. We'll see if it comes or not. By William Boyd. One man, many lives. Cashel Greville Ross experiences more of everything than most, from the rapturous to the devastating, from surprising good luck to unexpected loss. Born in 1799, Cashel seeks his fortune across the turbulence of multiple continents, from County Cork to rural Massachusetts, from Waterloo to Zanzibar, embedded with the East Indian Army in Sri Lanka, sunning himself alongside the romantic poets in Pisa. He travels the world as a soldier, a farmer, a felon, a writer, even a father, and he experiences all the vicissitudes of existence, including a once-in-a-lifetime love that will haunt the rest of his days. In the end, his great accomplishment is to discover who he truly is, which is the romance of life itself and the beating heart of the romantic. Now that sounds interesting to me. Historical setting, etc. All right. If you see me uh, kind of moving here, Keo, for some reason, is awake this morning. He's usually not a morning dog. And he is wanting a lot of attention. The Trade-Off by Sandy Jones. Oh, it says it's a mystery thriller as well. Okay, we did look at that one. We looked at that one on Monday. Uh, the Wolf Hunt by Eilat Gundar Goshen. Now that sounds like Okay, not to make fun of people's names, but that would be a great explicative. Gundar Goshen? Okay. Lilac has it all. A beautiful home in the heart of Silicon Valley, a successful husband and stable marriage, and a teenage son, Adam, with whom she has always felt a particular closeness. Israeli immigrants, the family has now lived in the U.S. long enough that they consider it home. But after a brutal attack on a local synagogue shakes their sense of safety, Adam enrolls in a self-defense class taught by a former Israeli special forces officer. There, for the first time, he finds a sense of confidence and belonging. 
Then tragedy strikes again when an African-American boy dies at a house party, apparently from a drug overdose. Though he was a high school classmate, Adam claims not to know him. Yet rumors begin to circulate that the death was not accidental and that Adam and his new friends had a history with Jamal. As more details surface and racial tensions in the community are ignited, Blalock begins to question everything she thought she knew about her son. Could her worst fears be possible? Could her quiet, reclusive child have had something to do with Jamal's death? The wolf hunt. Sounds interesting. So out of these, we yeah, check out a couple. Uh, the other ones here that we've not looked at. There are a lot of middle grade ones here. Dust by... don't know who that's by. It says Dusty Bowling. Okay. Uh, Ghost Book by Remy Lai. Lai. More Tales to Keep You Up at Night by Dan Poblocki. Nell and the Nether Beast by Adi Rule. So You Want to Be an Astronaut by Clayton Anderson. And Two Tribes by Emily Bowen Cohen. <laughs> I love that. Those were the middle, middle grade ones. Here's nonfiction. Let's go to cozies. Back to cozies. All right. Yeah. Okay. We stopped at. Excuse me. Got to. I had to take you out this morning, and I didn't. I've not taken my morning allergy medication yet. I think it's getting to me. Crime of the Cabana by Nicolette Pierce, first in the Coconut Cove mystery. Welcome to Coconut Cove, where the locals are quirky and the tiki drinks are served with a side of murder. When Bailey moves to the tropical paradise of Coconut Cove, all she wants is to settle into her new life. But when she discovers her beach bungalows are better suited for a bonfire than a place to live, and there's a dead body in the cabana, her dreams of paradise quickly turn into a nightmare, as it should. Attempting to salvage the bungalows and settle into her new life on the island, Bailey meets the peculiar locals. The more she learns about them and the victim, the more suspects are exposed. But who is the killer? With each new clue Bailey discovers, the killer draws near. She must discover the truth soon or risk becoming the next victim. And tell us about the Cabana Boys. These are ones that are coming out tomorrow. Now, Death by Numbers by P.L. Handley. Second in the Murder Ledger Mysteries. A murder in a haunted hotel? Not everyone likes a beach holiday. When Alan receives an invitation to spend a long weekend on the island of Angsley, he sees it as the perfect opportunity for a much-needed getaway. What he is not expecting is a brand new mystery involving a haunted hotel, a world-renowned psychic, and a shocking murder. After the success of her last article, Rhiannon is, I've never known how to pronounce that, I only think of Stevie Nicks, is determined, and I'm not going to sing, is determined to follow up her popular story with a piece on the reported hauntings of the Balamum Hotel. Joined by her trusty accountant sidekick, this journey to the other side of North Wales is about to get very strange indeed. Get ready for the second installment of the murder, murder Ledger Mysteries, where two amateur sleuths are put to the test in their greatest challenge yet. That sounds intriguing to me, and I kind of like the cover. You know, sometimes covers get really busy, and I like the simplicity of that. Uh, that is a book collection of Owl the Nerve. Uh, pun, puns. Where would we be without the puns? <laughs> of All the Nerve by Leanne Leeds, 13th in series. When Emma and Eddie's wedding preparations kick into high gear in Fork Bridge, Florida, Astra Arden, Emma's best friend and witch extraordinaire, 
is eager to play her part, but a deadly accident at the rehearsal dinner throws a wrench in the in the festivities. As Emma's big day approaches, Astra is caught in a whirlwind of wedding shenanigans, which she isn't exactly thrilled about. But when an intoxicated guest dies, chokes to death at the rehearsal dinner, Astra's excitement quickly turns to suspicion. Increasingly mistrustful of the guests and their dubious motives, annoyed that the best man Lothian is there every time she turns around, and frustrated that Archie, Astra's mischievous familiar owl, keeps himself keeps helping himself to the catered snacks instead of helping her solve the case, can Astra uncover the truth behind this mysterious mishap and save the wedding from disaster? That doesn't sound bad. A Body in a Cornish Village by D. MacDonald. Kindle Unlimited. Cornish cream teas in the sun, dog walks on the beach, and a murder investigation? Can Kate Palmer, part-time nurse and cake-loving sleuth, solve her most baffling case yet? Kate Palmer is delighted when she learns that her home, the beautiful seaside village of Tinworthy, is the setting for a new TV show. She's even more excited when she, her handsome husband, Woody, and her drama queen sister, Angie, are all invited to be extras. But when the cameras start rolling, the trio are in for a nasty surprise when the film's writer and producer, Crispin Wingard, Wingard drops dead. Before long, rumors start flying and Angie is in the spotlight for murder. Kate knows her sister had a brief stormy fling with Crispin during her younger days as an actress, but surely Angie couldn't have killed him, hated him that much, could he? Could she? Kate is certain of her sister's innocence and is determined to prove it, but who would want to kill Crispin and set the stage for Angie to take the fall? Could it be Fergal, Angie's jealous boyfriend, Sonia, the eccentric director who had a love-hate relationship with Crispin, or gorgeous guy, the hairdresser who held a grudge against the problematic producer for years. Armed with a list of possible suspects, Kate sets out to interview everyone she can. Over cups of tea, secrets start to spill out about overheard conversations and mysterious money transfers. But just as Kate thinks she's finally on the right track, her main suspect is found dead after a party in the village. To make matters worse, he's one of Angie's old flames too. So forget you read that part because that's kind of spoilerish. Oil Wells, Oatmeal Cookies, and Ornery Old Men. It's only 74 pages, so novella length, but it is also a Kindle Unlimited. Question, what does an oil tycoon's death, a group of old poker buddies, and a batch of freshly baked oatmeal cookies have in common? Answer, Tabitha Clive. Amateur sleuth and baker extraordinaire Tabitha Clive is out to out to help save Emma's son, Caleb, from standing trial for murder he did not commit. The year is 1980, and Tabitha Clive loves baking, writing, and running the family farm in her quiet town of Cornville, Nebraska. Well, Cornville was a quite small town until farmer Landon Turner discovered oil on his property, turning him into a wealthy tycoon overnight. The farmer's newfound wealth brings with it danger and darkness when the oil tycoon is found dead in his storm cellar. The situation becomes even worse when Emma's son, Caleb, becomes the prime suspect in Landon's murder. As Tabitha and Emma delve deeper into the case, they uncover a web of deceit, betrayal, and jealousy. The two women must break through the small town's gossip and secrets to uncover the truth that will clear Caleb's name. Stitching Concerns. by Catherine Michael. Stitching concerns and a thread of truth. Can Alex take back control of her life, put her embroidered past behind her before she's bound? Alex Bailey's mind is layered with ambivalence. A trip to Madras Island is exactly what this quilter has ordered. A kidnapping thwarts her travel and romantic rendezvous with Hawk. Just when she thinks she solved the mystery, a murder threatens to derail her once again. Can she arrange the details of the tangled threads before she's stitching in a ditch? As Alex uncovers a patchwork of secrets, will her quest for the truth 
also unravel everything she's ever known. 109 pages, but also kind of novella length. Hang on, coffee's required. Deadly Dining by Gwen Taylor and Jen Booker. Second in the Mia Watson cruise ship mysteries. When one door closes, another porthole opens. Writers blocked romance author Mia Watson has no idea what to do with her life now that she's caught her husband cheating and said bon voyage to him and his cocky cocky mistress at the last port, except maybe take the two-week cruise she won to get away from it all. But stumbling across a dead body drags her and her new friends into a deadly mystery where the only prize for solving it is getting out alive. Join Mia and the gang on a fast-paced adventure aboard the SS Bella Blanca as she breaks out of her shell, her cardigan, and her cardigan to become a heroine fit for a story all her own. It doesn't say how long it is. You're going to have to read it to find out. All right. Coming out on the 18th, which would be Friday, it says. Looks like another collection there. And Ghost Cornfields and Carvings. By J.A. Holder. Now they snuck this one in too. That one says September. Maple Syrup Series. Clear as Crystal by Iris Lee. And we are running out of time. We need to wrap things up here. Oh, let's go over here. Well, that was the fiction and the uh, and some more cozies coming out this week. So what I like to do if there are books that interest me is then I go to either Goodreads or they're on Amazon and I try to see if there's a, a sample to read uh, because the idea could be good. But then something in the writing just doesn't click with me or, or something. But that's that's my next step. Um, so uh, some of these have sounded interested to, interesting to me. So we've run out of the genres for this week. But um, I am going to be starting... Uh, uh, yeah. A, uh, a theme month I'm, I'm hoping to to get going in September spy versus by September and so tomorrow and Friday uh, I think we'll start looking at some of those um, spy kind of books not that they're new releases but just that there's some that I've read that I really liked and there's some that I'm interested in that I'd like to learn more about um, there are spy books for every type of reader there's not just the classic uh, spy thrillers, but there's humorous ones, there's middle grade ones, uh, there's romantic ones, and um, I just think it would be interesting to kind of spread the word that spy versus spy stuff is, is kind of fun. Uh, but I appreciate everybody showing up. Uh, if you're here this morning, thank you so much. If you watch it on replay, I appreciate that too. Be sure to hit the like button, the subscribe button, and the bell notification. Um, just so you know when when things are are happening and so tomorrow we'll be here at 6 a.m 8 a.m eastern and tonight we're going to be doing reading sprints at 605 mountain time 805 eastern time and that'll go for about two and a half hours bring your own book uh, if you want to work on a hobby if you want to meditate we uh, play very uh soothing music and so you can do any and all above there. I hope you have a really good Wednesday. For some reason, my brain wants to say it's Thursday, but it is only Wednesday and we're okay with that. Um, and I, uh,
Hope you have a good day uh, on purpose, as Olivia uh, Olivia Reads a Latte says. And I hope you're reading good things because remember, you don't get good person points for reading something you're not liking. Reading is fun. You, you're not doing this for an assignment. It's enjoyable. It's okay to set it down or put it on pause and read something. I'm a mood reader. This happens to me all the time. Listen to the voice of experience. Um, God bless everybody. We'll see you hopefully tonight. Bye-bye.